Slavery is wrong. Involuntary servitude is slavery. It is wrong. Sending people to prison and having them get out with all these barriers against them and, and knowing they're going to fail and wanting them to fail is wrong. Punishing people for life is wrong. Not practicing grace, mercy, and compassion is wrong. And I love you. And that's why I'm telling you, you're wrong. You're dead ass wrong. Repeat after me. I bring more than diversity. I bring irreplaceable perspectives. Hey friends, my name is Whitney and I'm the host of Impostrix Podcast, the show that validates professionals of color navigating imposter syndrome and racial toxicity in their career. Join us and be validated. You got this. My name is Whitney Knoxley. I am the um, host of Impostrix Podcast. We are a show that validates um, professionals of color who navigate imposter syndrome and racial toxicity um, in career. I am really happy to have my friend Walisha Wilson joining me today on the show. Um, Walisha and I know each other through work. Um, we, um, we're, we're not going to say the name of the, the job that we worked at, but, um, you know, I have great memories working with Walisha and learning a lot from her and with her, um, and some of our other colleagues. Walisha is someone who has, you know, survived insurmountable odds, um, owns two businesses, is a really a lifelong entrepreneur, it seems like. Every time I talk to Alicia, she has a different project going on um, and has been incarcerated and has come out and built a career for herself. So when I was thinking about how I was going to do this mini series, she was the first person that I thought of and the first person that I reached out to. Um, so Alicia, can you please introduce yourself? What are your identities? What do you bring into this space? Well, hello, everybody. I am Walisha. I am here in Atlanta. And as you stated, I am a formerly incarcerated woman, entrepreneur, nonprofit founder. What do I bring to this space? Energy all day long, authenticity, dopeness. Um, but yes, I keep my hands in a lot of stuff. And um, But it, it hasn't always been that way. Uh, Walisha, can you... Share with us, because I mentioned that you have a couple of businesses now, and I think I want to start with like where you are now and then go talk about like how you got there, what you had to overcome, what the barriers were. So can you talk to us about what what you do now? Well, you know, I do have a nine to five, like most of us is really hard to do. I have 50, 11 jobs. Let me say it like that, that most formerly incarcerated people end up having to do. But I do have a nine to five job um, and outside of my nine to five job, I work uh, a business consulting business where I assist individuals and organizations with uh, helping their businesses grow. And I take a lot of pride in that one, particularly because 80 percent of my clients are formerly incarcerated people. And um, I love that because of so many different barriers that we all have, entrepreneurship is definitely that pathway to building wealth and coming up out of a deep hole. And so it took me probably about, about 10 years really um, to get out of a rut. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people don't realize that when you get out of prison, people think you just go to prison and do your time. But actually I was only sentenced to six months, but I was, basically given a life sentence once I got out. And that life sentence came in, life sentence of being unemployed, being homeless and not being able to gain housing like I wanted to. I mean, I think one of the things I wanted to do most desperately when I got out was um, to go to my kids' PTA meetings or to go to a birthday party and also to see about getting health insurance and burial insurance. And I could not do any of those because I had a felony conviction. I could not go and onto the, to my kid's school, um, because I had a felony conviction, I could not get burial insurance. And because I had a felony conviction, I couldn't get health insurance. And I'm like, dang, I can't even die decent, you know? And it wasn't until I started doing research that there are 44,000 collateral consequences to having a felony conviction. 
Yes, and this is all after you served your time. 44,000? 44, 44,000 collateral consequences. And I hate to even call them collateral consequences. They're literally permanent consequences Yeah. Um, that people don't really realize. Um, and so it took me out of that rut of having to see what I needed to do, you know, and then because I was disabled, then there's that challenge of trying to get disability. And when you get disability, you can only work so much and you're limited and you're really literally stuck in a rut of poverty because when you go to prison, everything stops. And that includes your bills that pile up that when you get out, you may have not gone into prison in debt, but now you've gotten out of debt because it's not like the police will say, you know, we're going to arrest you. Go ahead and make sure all your bills are taken care of and paid four to six months while you're gone. Now you have stuff that's taken care of. If all your stuff, you had people to help handle your stuff and you didn't get your stuff put out while you got locked up. So you have to deal with all of this on top of that and wanting to go back to school and being told, oh, oh there's another collateral consequence. You can't go to school because you got a felony. You know, oh, oh, you can't start a business because you have a felony. Wait, PPP can't get a PPP. Because you mm -hmm. got a felony. And so these are all things that really kind of like binded, you know, binded me down. And I think I was depressed for a while, um, you know, just tired of it. And after a while, I said, you know, it got frustrating, but most of all, it got me upset, pissed off, but it got me motivated to act, to want to change it. I've never been one to want to just sit around and complain about challenges, but wanted to be able to find resolution and find out what the problem, what the challenges is. And that's how I started my nonprofit first, New Life mm -hmm. Second Chance Outreach. And that's what I want to do, give people a new life at a second chance by connecting them to resources and providers that wanted them. A lot of people see us as being liabilities, but we, we're never the last chance. We should never be the last resort. First, if you really want to know the truth, you should have gone to a formerly incarcerated person first if you wanted it done right. If you wanted somebody to come to work on time, you should have got a formerly incarcerated person. If you wanted somebody to be willing to stay late, you should have got a formerly incarcerated person. If you wanted somebody to be loyal on a job and not run and split tail the first time they get somebody else that's willing to give them a 50 cent raise, you should have hired a formerly incarcerated person. Um, and so I wanted to be in spaces where... I used to always want to put myself in places that either did not want me or where I did not belong. And so I was just on a quest of saying, you know what, I'm going to find people who want us in their spaces and see us as assets as opposed to liabilities. And so that's what I did. Mm. And so here today, it was just a way of um, started with one business, then it got to a second one and I'm on my third one. And I think part of it is um, the desire to not be homeless again. Mm. I am deathly afraid of being homeless again. Um, and so I just, um, I work all the time. I work all, all the time. And it it was easy at some point because I didn't really have friends. You know, you say you have friends or social circle, but it was easy when you have people that you talk to on occasionally or folks that don't really take a lot of your time, whether that's a relationship or just social circles. But um, now that I'm happily engaged and about to be married and I have someone who's saying, no, I want your time. You need to slow down. So that is, that is, that is my, that's my motivator now trying to slow down. But yeah, Well, so yeah. And, and really, you know, what I hear is a trauma response to homelessness and to what you experience where you are um, taking certain steps, like you said, to ensure that you're never homeless again, whether or not those steps are even necessary as far as, um, you know, whether or not you need additional income right now. Uh, of course, like everything that you're doing is amazing and um, great, but I I couldn't help but to think just about like the PTSD that you might be ex or you might have um, and just the trigger. And, and you know, yeah. luckily you found a productive way, like a helpful way, you know, being an entrepreneur as someone who has recently started businesses, this life ain't easy. Um, it's fun at times. It's empowering. It's like a lot of things, but easy is not one of them. 
Um, so that was one thing that that stood stood out for me. Um, you mentioned the the forty four thousand collateral consequences, and we talk about some during this uh, mini series over the course of April for Second Chance Month. I'm wondering when you are uh, at the point where you're currently in prison or jail and you're thinking about returning to, um, you know, the quote free world, are you, is there any kind of preparation for how to navigate these barriers? No, there isn't. And I'm glad you put those in air quotes because there ain't nothing free about the free world. Um, particularly, especially if you're on probation or parole, um, because you're still a slave to the state. Um, but no, when you, and and I was only gone for 11 months, but there are folks who are gone from the time they're 13 or 14 and getting out at the age of 50. Um, and so there is no preparation. Um, you, you know, they say, yeah, we take GD classes inside and uh, we have this, but be truthful with you. To me, reentry and those type of preparation should be done from the moment you you get processed and you're actually booked in and you're there. Um, and that's not it. Um, it's not done at all. Um, but I think that's intentional. And I think a lot of times people get upset uh, with it, but it's intentional. Uh, mm -hmm. Prison system is a business. And if you had a business that was making you money, you would not change anything that would cause you to stop making money. So they're not going to teach you how to manage your money. They're not going to teach you how to start a business from inside of the jail. They're not going to start you, uh, show you and talk to you about the good things of uh, starting college while you're inside, how to manage your money, how to be a better parent when you get out, how to control your anger. Because all of those things, if you can hone in those things, you'll be successful when you get out. And if you're successful, like I have, you won't go back. Um, and so if too many people get out and are successful and won't go back, then now we've got to close jails. Now we've got to lay people off. But part of the problem is the focus should not be on, we should make money off incarcerating people. We should make money off of impoverishing people. The focus should be, we can, if we work together as a community, well, one of the things I want to backtrack is 94% of the folks in jail are going to come home. So the question is not about if people are going to come home. The question should be about how do we want those people to be when they come home? Do you want your neighbors to be folks who are productive, who are sowing into the community or taking from the community? Now, I don't condone anybody doing something that they didn't work for or taking something that's not theirs. But a system that does not give people what they need to survive and thrive and take care of themselves and their families cannot expect their laws to be obeyed. That's just common sense. You know, so I think when people look and they say, well, you know, this is what they did. They did the crime of the time. But when you think about it, as a taxpayer, you should want people to be incarcerated. If they're going to be incarcerated, you should want people to be rehabilitated but you also want people to be able to prepare to come out to be productive citizens. Um, and that's not being done. To me, that's a waste of your money because prison doesn't solve anything. Some people who've gone back repeatedly for 30 years prove that prison's not doing anything. Um, and I really wish people would get over the fact of thinking all of the criminals are the ones who wear the orange. The criminals are the ones with the badges you know, who are opening the gates and who are freely being able to walk home back and forth every day. That's how we got COVID inside of the prisons. It wasn't the folks in prison, you know, so the in drugs and all of these kind of things. So I think part of it is folks just needing to change their mindset. But yeah, and understanding that it's intentional. Everything is intentional. The fact that now there's something going around now with people wanting to do automatic license plate readers. Who is that going to impact? Black folks. To find out who's driving without licenses, who's driving without insurance, black folks. 
Where are they putting the prisons at? They put them in the country, in all of these small little towns um, where at least 75% of the folks that's in the prison are Black folks. Um, and you take money out of those communities by counting those folks in the census and accounting they don't even live in and their children don't even live in. You know, not recognizing the fact that Black folks really built this country, um, but constantly target folks. So, yeah, it's it's intentional. It's it's for money. It you know what keeps coming up as I'm having these conversations is racial capitalism and is slavery. And racial capitalism is this idea for those that are not familiar, this reality, not even an idea, the reality that um wealth is derived upon the backs of people of color um off of the labor of people of color off of the sexualization of people of color and the fetishization of people of color um off of you know exploitation um of our intellectual property for example um and when i think about the prison industrial complex when i think about the 13th amendment and slavery still being legal um for people convicted of crimes the first thing that i think about is racial capitalism and how much gets done um from laboring people who are incarcerated uh with none of the protections that we have for those of us that are not incarcerated with barely any health care, with barely any um, safety protections, OSHA who, you know, like with, with no minimum wage, with, you know, no, no parameters around how to make this work humane. Um, and one of the things that I've heard as I've um, spoken to folks is the sense of regaining self-confidence, regaining um, a sense of belonging and navigating that imposter narrative when you're coming from an environment of being a literal number, of being property of the state, then being told that you're free, like we talked about before, but you're not because you have these 44,000 collateral consequences um, and now trying to operate in this world and make that transition of I'm not a number, I'm not a piece of property, I'm worth more than 50 cents an hour, I do know things even though for the past however many months, days, years, people have been yelling at me, telling me that I don't know anything, people have been gaslighting me, people have not been meeting my needs when they are people that are supposed to be meeting my needs, who who I am in the custody of. And so I wonder what what it has felt like for you as you've entered um, the workforce as an entrepreneur, somebody that owns their own business, um, but also as an employee, when, you know, some of the narrative that you are returning to the free world with is that you are a criminal and you are not trustworthy and you still have to answer to the state. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> I mean, it, it was it was very nervous. I think part of it because I'm originally from Columbus, Georgia, and the issue came up. Well, why don't you apply for this this position in Atlanta? And I immediately was like, oh, nope. You know, if I'm going to if I've been homeless before, it's easy to do it. If, if something happens, you can easily come up with six or seven hundred dollars. But Atlanta, no, not with those rents. Um, and that was the first anxiety. But then second, too, was not having the faith. I, I mean, I knew that God had kept me for so long, but I didn't have the faith then that um, it was time to leave. And then it wasn't until um, <clears throat> a friend of mine, Gloria, and her husband told me that they told me about a scripture about uh, a prophet who wasn't loved in his own land. And that's kind of where it was. I got tired of like, OK, the work that I'm doing here, I'm not seeing any fruit. Let me move and relocate. And I have been prosperous since I came. Now, the, the, the big the, the, the big thing is. For 10 years. 
of being out, whether it's sleeping on the bridge, whether it's staying on my sister's couch, finally getting me a little place that I could barely afford, um, <clears throat> to working at Denny's, to being in my car, to being in a hotel, like constant transitional with a 330 credit score, $250,000 debt, student loan, all of this stuff. But once I got the call that I got employed, but the fact that I had, and didn't have a car, but the fact that I had got a job, a good paying job, but not just a job, a job that sought me out, mm. a job that says, no, we want you. We're not worried about your background. To be honest with you, your background is why we're calling you. And so that when it went to God doesn't call, what is it? God doesn't call to qualify. He qualifies the call. What is it called? He doesn't <laughs> qualify. Whatever you it is. You know, I don't be knowing these, these scriptures, these Bible verses. You know, I don't know he this. Doesn't, he, he doesn't call or qualify. He qual qualifies those that call. So I felt that in that time, this is where he needed me to go. I need you to step out on faith and trust that if not just one, but two people from the same organization suggested that you go and apply. And apparently they see that you have some talented skill of knowing how to connect people who are returning home from prison to resources. I need you to go. Don't worry about how things are going to work. And he did it. He lined everything up. Not only with that job, when I got my check, I was able to move out of an Airbnb, out of a hotel, into my own place. In Buckhead, of all places. Not only was I able to do that, I was able to go and get a car. Brand new off the lot, five miles. Now, this is with a 400 uh, thing. And of course, I had to put a couple thousand dollars down on it. But I had it to give it. Then out of that came being able to pay bills. Oh, okay, I know I owe you this. I've been owing you this for 10 years. Let's see what we can do to help me get it done. Let me pay it. So today, and out of three years, I've had three new cars, one for each year that has come up where I've driven off the lot in a brand new. My credit score has gone up from a 330 to a 705 in three years. But all of that is to say the impact of having a job. That Ooh. is the difference that a job makes for people who need it? Because had I not had a job, yes, housing is just as important because if you don't have housing, you can have a job all day long. But if you ain't got nowhere to wear, you know, lay your head and you worried about where you're going to sleep, that can impact that. But to me, a job was number one because I could always go stay at somebody's house or uh, sleep at a bridge, on a bridge or even get a hotel room. But to know that a person can go because a job can be the difference in a person paying their bills, doing everything they need to do, pay taxes, file income taxes, and so into the community or not having a job could be the difference in them taking from the community. And this is why it's so important that we give folks second, third, fourth, fifth. That's why I really don't like second chance month or the second chance term. Some people have had second chances. Some people need their 10th chance. And if that's the case, fine. God forgave us 70 times, 70 times, seven. We ought to be able to do the same thing and extend that same grace to people. And so what I don't get is that we're in the Bible Belt, the Bible mm -hmm. Belt. That's supposed 80 percent of the folks in the United States are supposedly Christian. But yet we do not love our neighbor. But yet we exclude people because of something they did. But we forget about. Uh, a prostitute who helped the spies. We forget about a murderer who became a prophet. We forget about the savior who, I mean, we forget about all this and I could preach on about it, about it, about it. But we say that we are supposed to be people of compassion and forgiveness and showing grace. And we don't do that. We automatically look at people. You see black boys walk past your car. You're locking your door and pulling your, you know, letting your windows up. You're assuming that because someone who comes into the job that has dreadlocks, that they're less professional than another person. You're assuming that because someone has a criminal record, that they're not as smart. We have a lot of talent behind bars. There are folks who went to prison with doctorate degrees. So not everybody in prison is a dummy. Just because you get caught doesn't mean you're, you're dumb or stupid. You just got caught. But let me say this. Not everybody in prison is guilty. Over 64% of the folks that's in jail right now are there because they took a plea. I took a plea. So the question is, why do you take a plea? 
when when you're when you're innocent. People take pleas because they listen to folks who are supposed to be the experts that say, we know you're innocent. You're going to do this. We're going to get you out of here. But then you turn around and find out they're trying to railroad you 30 years up the road. And you say, you know what, just give my six months so I can go home. Or let me save a trial to spare my family embarrassment. Or let me just do this because I'm listening to you. People take pleas all day long. That doesn't mean that people are innocent. I mean, guilty, that just means people just tired and they're ready to go home. Or they didn't even really know they right. They're in there interviewing people. They ain't tell them they can get a lawyer. You in there interviewing children. They ain't told them they have to have an adult present. It's just a lot of reasons. And I tell people all the time, be careful what you say and how you treat people. Because the same people that you're doing wrong are going to be the same people that you're either going to need, need their help or you're going to be sitting right there in the cage next to them. And a lot of the CEOs that's in prison that are being busted uh, this whole thing about we don't want we I'm sorry we can't hire people with felony because because you're a liability or um, you know we have money on site okay the people that you hired in here that didn't have criminal records at first they stealing all the money they bringing in all the drugs they raping all the folks so what's the difference between them and that they just didn't get caught they didn't get caught they get caught we all have done something. But that doesn't mean that we're supposed to pay for that for the rest of our life. You had a baby at 12. You don't want to be 45 and still people talking about you had a baby at 12. And it's not until you get in your own other people's condition that when you have a problem with it, nobody wants to say anything. Like when we talk about crime in the community, you know who to shot Jojo down the street. You know, you know, you know exactly who it is, but you ain't told the police. You don't want to say nothing. Everybody that knocked on your door and asked you to help. But let your child get killed. You want to be all mm. in the news mad about why nobody's stepping forward. What you saw, what you put out is what, what you get back. And so people have to be reminded too that if I ain't supporting it, but I ain't gonna be mad if it happens. If every black person in the United States say we ain't working, we're not gonna work another dime until you treat us with the respect and dignity that you treat everybody else, we could shut the United States down. And I think the same thing would go for formerly incarcerated people. And people think folks in jail, oh, you, you do the crime, you should do the time. It says you should do your time. It does not say you should be gang raped. It does not say you should be denied going to the bathroom. It does not say that as a woman who gets a monthly cycle, which is a natural thing, should not be getting their sanitary napkins should be forced to have sex with COs just to get a phone call to their children. It does not say that you have to work for free. In the state of Georgia, you do not get work. You do not get paid to work in the state of Georgia. And we have folks in Georgia working everywhere from lingerie factories to furniture factories to tag making factories to even fighting forest fires in Georgia. But when they get out, we can't get jobs in those same fields. Now you say they did went to prison, they did their time, but now they're out. Could be working as a firefighter to help pay a mortgage, to help pay taxes. But because you're denying them, but you're mad, now you're complaining because they take them from you. You got to make your mind up. If you want folks to be successful or you don't want folks to be successful, people who are not successful ain't going to sit around and just stay unsuccessful and stay hungry. Folks going to eat and do what they need to do. So you got to make your mind up and figure out where is it best to put money. If I think you, we were talking about the eclipse, all this money folks are spending to celebrate three minutes <laughs> where you could have used that same amount of money to put into housing for unsheltered folks to sow into other formerly incarcerated entrepreneurs or nonprofit organizations that do a mutual aid. Any number of things. Any number of things. But you, you're, you're spending a lot of money uh, on three minutes, if you want to say pleasure. But I guess we do the same thing in life too, huh? We do. And I mean, this this thing that I keep hearing in this conversation is, you know, we we deserve grace. We should be giving grace. Yeah. Uh, and what space does grace have when time is money, when everything is money, money is money, you know, like that is the driver 
of capitalist societies, money Mm -hmm. and power. And we are a racialized society. And so race has everything to do with power and money. And, um, you know, black people in prisons and jails make up what 40% of the population, 45% of the population in prisons and jails, but 14% of the populations in the United States. We can't talk about incarceration without talking about structural race racism and the impact that incarceration has specifically on communities of color and the way that mass incarceration continues to feed the myth, the narrative, the stereotype that black people are dangerous, that black people are good for nothing, that black people are lazy, that black people will steal. Um, And it's, it's all related. It's all connected. There is no incentive to have successful reentry programs because we want to continue to feed the the prison industrial complex. We want mm-hmm. to continue to make money off of that. We want to continue to have extremely cheap labor um, so that our profit margins are larger. And yeah. it strikes me what you were saying about The skills that people are learning in prison, because they, you know, many people are working, not everybody, but many people are working, but they're not able to utilize those skills when they get out um, in in that profession. And I've talked also with folks who maybe they've gotten certifications um, in prison. One one gentleman, um, Marlon Baycoat, who is going to be on at the end of the month talked about getting his certificate or like his peer counselor, something of that nature, a program in Virginia for people that are incarcerated to be able to receive. And then once they get out to be able to work in that field, yet Virginia also has laws that say, if you have a specific type of conviction, you can Mm -hmm. go to school and get the certificate, but you can't then go work. Or get a license like Georgia. You can't get your license. And so it's um, the whole thing feels disingenuous. Like, let's just call it what it is. Um, we're we're not trying to have people be successful. We are trying to continue the status quo of us against them, of um, race and class and and the like. Um, and so we're not I, trying to prevent um, crime, because if you're trying to prevent crime, you would give folks jobs. And if we were trying to really want folks to be successful, we actually are sowing into the back ways. You know, when people say, so basically, you know, I'm not an abolitionist. And I tell people that all the time. I'm not an abolitionist. I believe there are places and some people who should be separated from other folks. But that doesn't necessarily mean for life. Um, but I, I think that when you you are dealing with people who are driven, they continue to look at the other stuff. Okay, so yeah, we're we going to lock these people up. You don't even think of alternative ways. Incarceration is not always the first thing. That's like people who, um, like when I grew up, the first thing you want to do when your child do something, you want to knock them in the mouth or whoop them. Just like whooping is not always the very first go-to thing. It should be a last resort, you know, when you actually physically got to do something. That's what prison should be. If a woman is caught out of a store stealing chicken and pampers, Certainly prison and jail should not be where she should be. She should be connected to resources. Now, should she be held accountable for what she did? Yeah, make a volunteer, you know, make her pay it back. But prison is not the answer to people trying to take care of their their basic needs. Now you've created a problem with her going to prison. Now you've created a problem with her children going into foster care. Now you've created a problem with them getting out of foster care and staying with her elderly parents who have got no business taking care of some spitfire 10, 11, 12-year-old children, and they're in their 70s. Now you're dealing with defects stepping in. Now you're dealing with behavior. You have this ever-flowing domino effect of particularly removing mothers out of the home. But I I mean, I think it's, like I said, again, intentional, just like the welfare system. You took all the Black men out of the house. And then you tell the women, we'll give you more food stamps if you don't have a man in the house. You know, so now we're paying for this because now we have children out of control who don't have fathers around to to, to handle, to, to discipline them. But wait, when you do whoop them, now you got the law knocking at your door about whooping your children. So you can't have it both ways. 
you know, and a whooping ain't never hurt nobody if you ask me, but you can't have it both ways. I, and, and God corrected us. There's nothing wrong with correcting. Correction is good um, when you mean it for the right purpose. But I think what people are not realizing when let's talk about slavery. When we're talking about prison slavery. Yes, people did something. Do you know that when folks go in this, I'm not going to get out here in the sun and work. Folks are thrown in solitary confinement. Folks are beat up. Folks will have other gangs sicked on them to be beat up and raped. Their benefits are taken from them. They're thrown in solitary confinement. But then when they get out, you're mad because your cousin and nephew can't go down to the city to get that $30 hour job as an engineer because they tell you they're not hiring. They're not going to hire you and pay you $30 an hour if they got a slave doing it for free. Right. So if if nothing is going to make you mad about the fact that you're using people, that should make you mad because it contributes to unemployment. Because those are jobs that folks could be having that can make money so they can pay tax. When people make money, they spend money. So people can't spend money if they don't have money that they can make. You know, so I just think it's just to me, it's just it's, it's just common sense. And I think all of it is with an intention to out of fear. You know, I can recall my, my grandma saying that she was one of them folks that <laughs> believed, you know, that segregation was a good thing. Mm. Um, and I was like, what? Say what? But she pointed out there's to me, there's always good and bad. Like even when I was homeless, there were some good and bad because I might have been homeless, but I was still warm as opposed to someone who was unsheltered and wasn't. Mm -hmm. So she's like, you got to look at the silver lining. When we were segregated, we didn't, our children didn't act out the way they're acting out. Our children wasn't saying, get out of my room and close. That's once we started mingling with other folks. When she can say she can recall that right now if you were to go in within six blocks of your house right now, Whitney, and walk out your door. How often, how many of those businesses would be black owned businesses? But back in her day, 95 percent of the folks were business owned. So if you needed mm. your shoes done or you needed a key to be changed or locked, all the business owners were black. No. So it, it's. I think that's primary of the reason. And we saw that with Oklahoma. We saw that with Florida and all of those riots of burning down what we did good. I think it is the fear that you really don't think Black people are lazy. You really don't think Black folks aren't creative. You know we're creative because every time we create something, you're copying it. You know that every time we're somewhere, you're trying to be in the same space that we are in. Um, or you take it like Aunt Jemima. And you throw and, and, and put her on, but take it and you make the money off of it. And it doesn't, it's the same thing with formerly incarcerated people like myself and other folks, not just, and, and, and recently it has been by other formerly incarcerated people who are, have been taking advantage of formerly incarcerated people. But I'm talking about folks in general who know for a fact that you're out here telling your story, you're not out here doing work but you're not making near as much as what you should be making or what you're worth. And they figure because you're formerly incarcerated, you should just be happy to have a bone thrown at you as opposed to seeing you as an expert and paying you for what you're worth. And that happens a lot um, where other folks are benefiting from your talent and your hard work and, and what you're doing. And they just slap their name on. Um, I don't even know. Um, I don't even know that. That happened with one of the guys who presented like the cotton gin or something that it was a black guy that actually did. It. But because back then, you know, nobody would have recognized it. The white guy just stole it. And, and that was it. And I think that happens today. And it's the same thing with our labor. It's the same thing with not recognizing that what we're doing, um, whether it's the roads that are being built um, from agriculture. I just don't understand why folks just don't shut it down. I'm talking about everybody, people of color. They're the ones out in the field, you know, whether it's Latino, whether it's brown. We're the ones out there pulling in corn, cotton, uh, all the silk. All this stuff is done by people uh, of color, whether they're Asian and, and whatever. So I think it is just exploitive in nature for the oppressor to drain us of everything 
that we have. And then when you have that little bit of freedom and say, you know what, bump a job. I'm just going to start my own business. And then they say, well, you know what? I got a way. I'm going to stop you with that. We're going to stop you. You know, we're just not going to give you the PPP. You know, we're going to come up with other ways to do it. But then you have to just stay strong, navigate it and say, you know what? I'm still going to get it. You know, it strikes me as I was thinking about this conversation and, and what we would talk about that the job that you and I um, worked together um, at was the first and only uh, employer that I've worked with that has explicitly and, you know, publicly hired people um, who are formerly incarcerated. No other job that I've worked at, they may do it, but they definitely don't, you know, talk about that these are qualities, this is the quality, this experience is a quality, particularly for the work that we're doing. Um, and that was pretty, you know, amazing for me to realize. And I'll also say that when I started at that job, um, you know, the first night, I think it was during an interview, you know, I learned my first lesson around um, human dignity and incarceration, which is the language that we use um, mm -hmm. to talk about people who have been incarcerated and using humanizing language instead of dehumanizing language. So not using terms and labels like inmate, like felon, like ex-con. Um, language that is so ingrained in our vocabulary um, whether you are a person who is interacting with the criminal legal system or not. And so one of the things that, you know, I work on is sharing around humanizing language um, because I think that's something relatively simple that people can do who are looking for ways to start to chip away at this system of oppression of the carceral state. Um, but I wonder on as far as actionable things that we can be doing as colleagues and as employers and entrepreneurs to get people these jobs to, because I agree with you. I agree that a job means everything. A job means everything for anybody, mm -hmm. not just formerly incarcerated people, not people with disabilities, not, you know, whatever subgroup of people, a job and being able to earn money so that you can support yourself means everything. Yet we've decided that some groups of people aren't deserving of jobs and aren't deserving of housing and aren't deserving of health care and, you know, however many things. Um, so I'd like to know what your what your thoughts are on what we can do, especially because of your experience working with people who are building businesses as an alternative to finding jobs, um, maybe because of the barriers that they've experienced um, because of their incarceration or shoot arrest record doesn't even have to be incarceration. Well, I think my first, I think the first thing we have to do, and this is not just for folks like me who are formerly incarcerated, but also the folks in the community, we do have to change the language. I think um, people treat you, for one, how you act, who you hang around with, and how you are seen or referred to as. And I think some of the laws, like a lot of the laws that are being passed, they're being passed uh, to punish animals, to punish savages, to punish convicts, and to punish prisoners. But if the language was changed, to where laws are not uh, seen to punish humans and people, fathers and mothers, I think that would make a big difference. Mm -hmm. um, I think the second thing would be for folks to just realize that we are human and we're people, we all make mistakes. That's why it's called grace and forgiveness. Um, to also not be so shallow minded. Uh, to know that and educate yourself. Not everybody in jail or prison is guilty. Um, I think one, we need to see that we are actually more alike than we are different. And if you say that you are a believer or a person of faith, regardless of what that faith is, that is what should be leading you first and foremost. 
So that should be, hey, now this is wrong. What do you gain by locking someone up, not paying them to do work, taking them from their home, denying them access to their children and family, which phone calls should be free anyway, denying them access to their family so that they can still be able to discipline their kids, talk to them on the phone. I ain't going to be in the jail all day. When I come home, I'm telling you, we're going back to what we were doing. To do that, and then put them in there. Like you said, there's no health care. You have to actually pay. Now, you're not paying me to go out here and work landscaping, but I have to pay 5 to $10 to see the doctor every month, whether I'm diabetic or not. If I have a cycle, I have to pay for that. If I'm diabetic, I have to pay for that. If I have cancer, I have to pay for those treatments. All of these things you have to pay for. Mind you, while you're still in prison, you're still obligated to pay federal taxes to the IRS. You're still obligated to pay student loans while you're incarcerated. You're still obligated to pay child support. Now, I don't know about them, but all of that from nothing, from nothing, you can't get nothing. As opposed to saying, give these folks what, they, what, what they're due so they can send their mama and daddy money home so that they're taking care of their children, so they can pay child support. So when they get home or if they got applications that they're trying to get a job while they're out, they can be doing this stuff while they get... So when they get out, they can slide and transition right on into that position. So that's it. Thank you, Sharon. So that they can pay and sow into a community. So I think first and foremost, folks ought to be thinking that same question. Because I think some people, when they think folks go to jail, they ain't getting out. So the question should be, if Whitney gets out and she comes stay next door to me, do I want a neighbor that every time I go out, I got to put cameras up around my house. I got to have my neighbor down the street checking on my house. Do I got to not bring Christmas presents here so they won't see my big, large TV screen boxes, empty boxes in the trash? No, I want a neighbor that says, I don't need to steal your shit because I'm going to work to get my own. Mm -hmm. I need a neighbor that says, you know, I don't really care what you do. I really don't care. And I think you have people that say the same thing about folks with sex charges. Them folks just want to mind their own business. Half of them, while you're watching them, you should be watching the teacher, the PE coach, your nephew, and your own husband that's in the house messing with them. And they just want to go to work. Mind their own business. But again, Christian folk got to run people off their jobs, got to run people out the neighborhood. It's no different than if you continue to keep calling child stupid for long, what's going to happen? They're going to think they're stupid. They're going to think they're stupid. If you continue to keep, uh, you got your cousin staying with you and because your cousin had a history of substance abuse, every time something gets stolen, it ain't even got to be money. It was the last piece of light bread in the bag. You, you accusing your cousin. Stuff like that does not allow folks to have grace and forgiveness. You've got to be able to say, this person took something from the community now let's figure out ways for them to give back. And if we give them what they need, they'll give back. Because Wally should spend too much money. If I ain't had no job, I could have either resorted to taking what you got. But instead, I get to spend my own money. I get to pay my own taxes. And I get to sow into the community. I get to now donate to organizations. I get to pay my tithes in church. That is a good feeling to be able to give God his 10% and more. But you can't do that. Oh, because some churches in Georgia and probably across the country do background checks. So that's a, add that to another list of collateral consequences. You can't even go to damn church no more without them saying, oh, yeah, we do random uh, background checks in the church. We know that you came up, uh, you had a charge. And some people, I got out of prison and I've been put out of three churches because I had a felony conviction. Because the members felt uncomfortable being in a social space with somebody who had just got out of prison. But mind you, this is about after a preacher who probably done been to prison, just got out the pool pit, talking about a man who was in prison. It's it's backwards. It's, it's backwards. So we're not giving folks mm -hmm. the connections that they need. Like salmon don't swim upstream. And it's no different than you bag a dog in a corner for so long, they're going to bite. So I think 
the community just has to rally around and say, you know what, we want safer communities. We complain about it's not the teacher job to be the therapist, the counselor, the police officer, the security guard. What can we do to get these parents back into school and help take care of their children? Well, you can't, not with policies that say they can't come on the campus if they got a felony. So the community should be rallying to say these are policies. And, and I'm not saying community, I'm talking about black folks. There are cities right now in Georgia and Alabama that are 85% black. Ain't never had a black mayor, all white city council. That don't make no sense. You should be able to say as a community of black folks and white folks, this is my neighbor. This is my friend. She's white. She's black. I love her like she's my sister. I don't like the way y'all treating her. Mm. I don't like the fact that she's out here and can't get housing with a felony that's 20 years old. I don't like it. I don't appreciate it. When you're going to places like I do, and I just started doing it probably about seven or eight years ago, I don't care what I go to eat and how hungry I am. And sometimes I be hungry all the time. I have gone to maybe four places and it took me an hour and a half to find something to eat because every time I go through the drive through, I ask them, Hey, welcome to so-and-so. Welcome to so-and-so. Hey, how you doing? What can I get for you? Uh, can you tell me first that when y'all hire people, do y'all hire people who've been to jail or prison? And they be mm -hmm. like, what? We ain't hiring. That's not the question I ask you. I ask you that when you are hiring, do you hire people who have gone to prison or jail? And they'll be like, no. And I said, well, you can cancel my order. I don't, I'm not really interested in the order. Sometimes I have to go to three or four different places to do that. Wow. Because I am not going to give you my money. Don't shop where you can't work. Don't live in places that don't want you there. Don't give your money to businesses that do not respect you. And I see it all the time when we go into these hair shops and I don't know what they be talking. I don't know what the language is, but I know they ain't saying nothing nice about the folks that sitting there spending all their money on that expensive weed. I do my best to shop black, shop small, or shop places that are formerly incarcerated owned or will hire people who are formerly incarcerated because I see no need to give you my money if you won't even hire me or my nephew or my niece. Mm -hmm. That makes no sense. And mm -hmm. there are communities right now, little convenience stores, KFCs, all these little places, slap dab in the middle of the hood. And then you ask them, do they hire people with records? And they'll say no. And I'm thinking, why are you in this side of town? Why are you even in this side of town? But that's our fault. Because we could choose to not just be lazy. We could say, you know what? I know you right here in walking distance of my house, but you got a policy that does not benefit me and my community. So we're going to get in our car or we're going to walk down here and we're going to go give our money to somebody else. And I guarantee you, if there ain't nothing else that people don't see the skin, color your skin, they don't hear the loudness of your voice, they're going to they gonna, they gonna feel that dollar walking. So that's why I say, Getting together as a community, whether you're black, whether you're white, but as humans, as Christians, as people who believe that people deserve compassion and dignity, you get together and you rally and you say no more. We're not going to put up with this in our community. We're not going to be in a space where we are able to live comfortably and walk comfortably and allow you to continue to treat people this way. Give them what they need. You mm -hmm. spent money. This city has spent $18 million on a three-minute eclipse but have no problem walking past people sleeping on sidewalks with tents and your only answer to them is let's give them more tents. No, we're not going to put up with it. We don't want it here. We're not going to put up with it. And I think if you do that long enough, people, they'll get the message. Mm. Thank you so much for this conversation, Walisha. Um, I love these, these last points that you left us, these ideas that you left us around um, our spending power, like taking the power that we do have and uh, being intentional about what we do with it. Um, can you share with us where folks can find you and also the names again of your um, businesses so that if folks want to patronize your business or donate, they can? Well, I am on um, IG as I am Walisha. And then I am, one of my businesses, Beautiful Pride, which is one of my t-shirts right here. That says, um, I can't read it. 
What am what I am not? I am not an ex-con. I'm not a convict, prisoner, inmate, offender, or felon. What I am is a doctor, a lawyer, a professor, entrepreneur. I am not my past. So this is beautiful pride. Um, and then Phoenix is on IG Phoenix Employment Services. So I'll make sure I put it in the chat. It's Phoenix Recruiting and Employment Services on IG. But if you go to my uh I just dropped it in the chat. If you go to my uh, profile, all my business is there as well as my nonprofit organization is there, New Life Second Chance Outreach, which is a Georgia nonprofit um, that connects people impacted by an arrest or conviction or incarceration to background-friendly, felony-friendly resources and employers and landlords. Um, to connect them to what they need. And um, we are all volunteer organization. And that's what I love about it. Not that we're all volunteer because we all want to get paid, <laughs> but I love the fact that 90% of the board of directors are formerly incarcerated folks. I love the fact that even despite that, they donate and they sow into the organization. They believe in the mission um, because we all need to help one another. And um, that's what we do. And so um, that's where I'm at. And uh, I also, on, on the side, I don't know how many hours I got. I got a nine to five. And after five o'clock, I'm doing two hours here, two hours there. So I'm probably get about four hours of sleep. I do, uh, I sell uh, legal shield. And I do that. And that became a really easy thing because as, you know, broke person, unemployed person, I didn't have uh, a lawyer. And I think regardless of your monetary status, everybody deserves adequate legal representation. And I ended up getting it for twenty nine ninety five a month. And because I was formerly incarcerated, my landlord was taking advantage. Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. one letter, that twenty nine ninety five dollars a month, where a landlord was like, okay, well, your water's brown. Who cares? Give me my $900 a month rent. Water was brown. Um, I mean, this was the whole time I was there. I had to bathe with bottled water, bathe with gallon water. And he did it because I was formerly incarcerated and had just been homeless. And he knew I needed somewhere to go. I called Legal Shield. They sent him a letter. Not only did he give me my money back, he dropped the eviction and told me he can keep the key. I mean, so I, I, I just try to everything that I do from my businesses are to empower other folks and um, to give back to people and to say, hey, you know, we all have had hard times and challenging, but these are things that you can you can do. So I'm here and this is what I do. Hopefully y'all uh, uh, follow me and Stay connected with me and uh, good to see some of my board members and my friends online uh, joining us. And I'm so glad. And I thank you so much for this uh, conversation. with. And we definitely need to have it again because you you are very authentic. I love your spirit. Mm -hmm. I love um, your conversations of wanting to talk about things that make folks feel uncomfortable. And I think I think that's tendency of why I have and people say, oh, Walisha, I ain't got a lot of friends. I have a few good friends. But I think if people can't be around somebody who's raw and authentic, who's going to tell you the truth, then they're not really your friend. I want somebody to be around me and say, you know, she's going to tell me, you know, what's the truth. I don't want to hear, it, but that's what we need to hear. And that's why I'm telling everybody in the world in the atmosphere, because I love you. Slavery is wrong. Involuntary servitude is slavery. It is wrong. Sending people to prison and having them get out with all these barriers against them and, and knowing they're going to fail and wanting them to fail is wrong. Punishing people for life is wrong. Not practicing grace, mercy, and compassion is wrong. And I love you. And that's why I'm telling you, you're wrong. You're dead ass wrong. So. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I see our comments in the chat. People really appreciated this conversation. And I know I did. Um, if this is your first time listening to Imposters Podcast, I invite you to follow me. My name is Whitney Knox Lee. I, of course, am the host. I'm an attorney. I'm a mediator. And um, I'm an anti-racism and DEI consultant. I um, love you, Walisha. Thank you so much for being here. Um, and I'm I'm looking forward to continuing the conversation offline. All righty. Y'all have a great night. Thanks so much for joining me for this conversation. I hope that you got as much out of it as I did. Feel free to continue the conversation with us over on Facebook at the Impostrix Podcast Validating Space. We welcome all, and it's a space for us to validate each other as we work through work, race, 
and imposter syndrome. You can find out more about me or about the podcast at www.impostrixpodcast.com. And don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Impostrix Podcast. Until next time, be validated.